Hi, everybody. Happy Sabbath. It's great to be back with you guys. Um, we have an exciting lesson. Of course, I think I say that every time, but it's always exciting when we get to look into the Word of God together a little bit, and it's always fun with the gentleman that I have tonight. Uh, Chuck is here, Isaac is here, and of course, Pastor Gilbert uh, will round us out uh, at the end of the lesson. But we're looking at Lesson 7, which is the Covenant at Sinai. And so we're very excited to look at this. I think as Christians in general, and maybe Adventists in particular, we have ideas about this covenant idea at Sinai, uh, famous children's stories with Moses and uh, the Israelites. And so let's see what we can expand upon uh, today as we look at this covenant. I appreciated where the author of the lesson started right here in Exodus uh, 19, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Want to open with prayer first. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we can come together to study your covenant one more time. God, keep us uh, it, with our minds focused on you, our hearts dedicated to you, and uh, an appetite to learn more about you, God, we pray. As we look at this tonight, may your spirit just continue to guide us and lead us into a richer and deeper understanding. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So if I look at Exodus 19, uh, verse 4, in the RSV it says this, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, God says, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And I'm appreciative, again, that the lesson starts here, because I think the emphasis, as we've talked about several weeks ago also, of the covenant of God is that it's something he established or he initiated. And we're going to see that a little bit tonight in, in the first couple of days here, is that it is a God initiated covenant. Um, if you read the verse again, it says, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings, God says, that I brought you to myself. Um, if we flip to Sunday, we can see this even built in a larger biblical perspective with different verses. The author titled it appropriately on eagle's wings, and we'll look at that verse in a moment. Um, but the author of the lesson points out in these verses that we'll look at that we are simply helpless at times. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility or, or an action to take. But I think understanding our helplessness or our helplessness in nature, perhaps, is important when we always study the Word of God. I was in a discussion a few weeks ago with um, uh, Kelly, and she reminded me that while God and Jesus is my friend, there's still an awesomeness and a reverence and a holiness about God that we don't want to, to, to shrink or, or belittle when we say Jesus is my friend. We're right, he is our friend. But there's still this massive God, this powerful God, this, this amazingly holy God that we worship. And this God that is in control of and creator of all chooses to bear us on eagle's wings. And that it gives me goosebumps just thinking about the love of God in this fashion because of, of that nature of God and the nature of me and how they seem so opposite here. But God is still my protector, we will see. He's still my guide. So the author has a few texts that he looks at to help emphasize this act of God, this deliverance of God. One of them is Exodus 19.4, which is where we just read also where uh, in the King James Version, it says, I carried you. Instead of I bore you up, I believe it says, I carried you on eagle's wings. Uh, another verse that he talks about is Deuteronomy 
129 and a few words to pull from there is that God goes before us and that God will fight for us and that God again will carry us. Hosea 11, 1 um, is another verse and there the Bible says that God calls us out. So we have these attributes of God and I'm going to look at Deuteronomy 32 in a moment, but we have these attributes of God already building uh, a picture of what God does for us, even in our helpless nature. So let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 10 to 12, which is where I want to spend the bulk of Sunday. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version again. And verse 10 says this, he found him, God found us, we could say, in a desert land and in a wasteland a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. I I just pause here for a moment to think about these words, and I picture God, the creator God, the God of heaven, the God uh, before all time that we understand it, finding me as a helpless infant, a child not knowing where to go or which direction to run in a wilderness, maybe of my own doing. So maybe if I were to translate this for me personally as Jameson living in 2021, maybe he found me in my mistake, in my sin, in my, in my lostness, looking around, trying to find an oasis to dig myself out of. But all I see is a wilderness, a a desert land. And it says something right here. And I think we can all relate because we've had moments of lostness and barrenness and, and disappointment or frustration or anger, whatever our lost, helpless feeling was. But then the second part of this verse says, God encircled you or God encircled me. And then he instructed me and he kept me as the apple of his eye. And I think that's the biggest thing that the author is trying to point out here in Sunday's lesson is that you, me, is helpless. And God comes and he first encircles us or, 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 or surrounds us and then gives us instruction. And then the apple of his eye, or as the Hebrew would point this out, the point is the very center of the eye the gate of the eye. Um, it's, it's pretty much telling you how precious that part of the eye is. So when you hear the apple of the eye, it's how precious we are. To finish off the verses real quick, uh, 11 and 12 state, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. Uh, picture an an eagle getting ready to shoo out the young little uh, eagles in the nest to fly for the first time. And if the eagle falls out of the nest and learns how to fly, then great, the instruction has worked. The, The time frame has worked for that eagle to grow and fly. But if the mother eagle shoos out the little eagle and it doesn't know how to fly, the parent eagle goes underneath and catches it before it hits the ground. That's the God we look at tonight. This is the God we look at in this lesson. This God who helps us in our time of need or lostness or helplessness or whatever it is. Uh, And at the end of Sunday's lesson, the question is posed, and we won't dwell on this here tonight, but think about it on your own time. How does knowing that God has so much concern for us help us have that much concern for others? So this is the setup of this whole lesson of the covenant at Sinai. And I want to turn it over now to Chuck, who's going to talk about Monday's lesson and the pattern of salvation. Thank you, Jamie. The text that begins the lesson uh, is from Exodus 6. Verses 6 and 7, and it's from the Revised Standard Version. This is in the quarterly, 
I'm going to read it and to the listeners, uh, listen to it as I read it and count how many times in this passage God says, I am, and how many times in this passage God says, I will. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment, and I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Did you count? There's five I wills and three I ams. It's interesting uh, in this passage, he uses the I am. And you remember when uh, he was talking to Moses, he said, who shall I tell them? Moses asked him, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am. I am that I am. So that's the name God actually used for himself in the Old Testament, I am. And here he's saying it in Exodus, I am the Lord and I will be your God. In the middle, there's a passage that talks about a, a small paragraph that says, when God says to Israel through Moses, I will redeem you, Exodus 6.6, 6, he literally says, I will act as the kinsman redeemer or goel. That word goel occurs elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, can you think where it is? It's Boaz, Ruth. When she sleeps at his feet, he takes her for a wife and he redeems her. He is there. She is, he is her goel to redeem her. So at the end of the day's lesson, there's three texts. How do you understand the idea of God's ransoming or buying back his people from slavery? What was the price that had to be paid? What does this tell us about our worth? Mark 10.45 says, God came to serve. He gave his life a ransom. First Timothy 2.6 says, who gave himself a ransom for all. And Revelation 5.9, you ransomed by your blood, the saints. The use of that word three times, ransom, let, piqued my interest in the word. So I got out the Greek New Testament to look the word up found out that the word is lutron, lutron. And so then I wanted to do, uh, find a little more about that word. Uh, the New, New Revised Standard Version in a footnote says that it's originally it meant a compensation required to release or redeem someone. Um, and then use the examples from Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. And it was subsequently developed as a metaphor for the reclamation or redemption of God's people, particularly by Christ. And there's four texts that they cite, Romans 3, 25 through 21 to 25, 23 to 25, that's a very commonly read text. And 1 Timothy 2, 5 to 6, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19, and Revelation 5, 9. I said them too far fast for anyone to write them down, but you can probably find them again if you want to look them up. So I want to talk a little bit about the word ransom and what it means and how, uh, and how we use it in theology for what Jesus did for us. Currently, we have something, in fact, that was in the news this week, a demand for ransomware. Uh, when it's used like that, it's actually an attempt to uh, extort money from a business. They send in a ransomware software, which freezes up their computer system, and then they demand a large amount of money 
for them to release it. So that ransomware is a, a problem, but it's the current use of the word ransom. But there are, I think, some theological issues that we have to be care careful of when we use uh, the word ransom to describe what Jesus does for us. Uh, he obviously um, lives and dies for us. And we say that he ransomed us from our sins. But if I ask you a couple of questions about that, I think you'll see why it's a little bit uh, difficult. We need to be a little careful about entering that idea into our theology of how we're saved. If Jesus, through his death, ransomed us by his blood, in other words, he paid a price for our forgiveness, who is he paying it to? Certainly, he doesn't have to pay it to the Father. The Father himself loves us. The Father does not need his son's blood to forgive us. So if he's not paying it to the Father, who is he paying it to? He's certainly not paying it to the devil. <laughs> so the idea that he ransoms us is the idea that he frees us. But we need to be a little careful about how we're, how literally we take that idea. And if if you're going to pay a ransom, you have to pay it to someone. And in this case, uh, Jesus is not paying it to the devil, I don't think. And his father certainly wouldn't require it. Uh, you know, Jesus came and lived on this earth so we would know exactly what God was like. And he died in the process, which showed us how to what lengths he would go to show us his love for us and ironically he died at the hands of very religious people which to me is another lesson and that is you have to be careful of, of very religious people sometimes they're dangerously religious uh, the jews were certainly with jesus so that's my little uh explanation of ransom and the use of it in the theology. And with that, I'll yield to uh, Isaac for Tuesday. Thanks, Chuck. I really appreciated the definition of ransom that you brought out as far as the freeing aspect. Uh, I, think, I think that really plays a big role in the perspective of how sin well, we're a slave to sin, right? And, and to be ransomed allowed Jesus, uh, God, to, to break us free of that, to buy us back or to free us from that. Fantastic, Chuck. Really appreciated that highlight there. Um, Isaac, I'll let you do Tuesday and Wednesday back to back here. And then, um, uh, or I should say, I'm the Sinai Covenant and the God and Israel. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Chuck, for setting the stage uh, for the Tuesday and Wednesday lessons. Um, so the Tuesday's lesson is titled The Sinai Covenant. And um, basically, you have uh, the author trying to highlight um, three major events that are prominent in the book of Exodus. Um, first of all, the Exodus itself, um, which in of itself is, uh, was a very powerful, mighty act of God, um, showing the powerful deliverance of a loving and promise-keeping God. Um, secondly, the establishment of the covenant. And the third part is the building of the tabernacle sanctuary. Um, but that, the primary focus um, of this section of the lesson is the covenant that was established between um, by God between him and the children of Israel, and really the role it plays in the overall plan of salvation. So when, when we think about the story of um, Exodus, I'm going to look at it in, from two angles. The, the entire experience itself of the, the entire experience of the children of Israel, just from Egypt to Sinai, and the covenant that was made at Sinai in terms of God's plan um, of revealing himself and his plan of salvation that is depicted in the, the sanctuary ritual. 
So if you think about it, um, going back to Egypt, um, you know, when the children of Israel were um, asked to leave, uh, Moses uh, requested for them to leave. There was the lamb that was sacrificed at the first Passover. Basically, that lamb was, uh, you know, pointing to Christ, the sacrifice that Christ was going to make for sinners who are really under the bondage of sin. If you think about the children of Israel at that time, they were under the, the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And Egypt basically is a representation of an anti God, kingdom, power, you know, representing the devil and, um, you know, their desire to keep um, the children of God under the slavery or the bondage of slavery. And so you, you think about the whole process of how they left and the experiences they went through, um, through the, the Red Sea. Um, Paul uses some examples, um, I mean, metaphors of how the Red Sea experience um, was a baptism into Moses, basically Moses being a type of God, a type of Christ in the sense that he was a mediator um, and the whole Red Sea experience being a, a type of baptism. And if you think about salvation and the process of salvation, you know, it's God first offering the sacrifice of his son, you know, to deliver us from the bondage of sin. Um, the whole Red Sea experience and the wilderness experience um, was uh, another thing on its own where they, they went through difficulty, but in all of those challenges, God was there to provide. He provided manna, he provided water when they needed it. He provided cloud over them. And so God, in his acts of mercy, really took care of his children, even before we get to Sinai. And so when we get to Sinai and the covenant is made, it's really um, God sort of um, you know, solidifying or basically showing the children that this is what I've done all this time for you. And so going forward, if you work with me, if you cooperate with me, this is what we can do. Because even in Egypt, the Israelites could have said, you know, we don't want to leave Egypt. And there was nothing God could have done. There, there was that cooperation that um, they had to put in, in terms of working with God to be able to get out of the bondage of sin. And uh, one thing that um, we need to keep in mind also when we start studying or trying to understand the covenant at Sinai is basically a fulfillment that um, God made to the patriarch of the promises God made to the patriarchs. You know, he promised Abraham that through him the, the earth uh, would be blessed. Um, and so God revealing himself to the children of Israel and the plan of salvation is basically a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant that we have already studied in the previous uh, you know, lessons of um, this quarterly study. So um, God revealed himself in a very um, full and entire manner in the way the sanctuary ritual was established. The sanctuary service was established basically as a way of showing God's plan of salvation. Um, so it was supposed to be a means by which the children of Israel um, were to reveal others to the world also really by their experience with God. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 77 verse 13, he says, your way, O Lord, is the sanctuary who is so great a God as our God. So um, the way of the Lord is the plan of salvation, which is revealed in the sanctuary. And when we think about the sanctuary, um, just kind of um, give you a little insight. Um, basically, when we, you, you think of the, the plan and how it was drawn out, you have the altar of burnt, um, the altar of burnt offerings where animals were sacrificed, which was just located just inside um, the entrance, um, the altar represents the cross of Christ. The animal represents Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. You know, um, you also have the lava, which was located 
between the altar and the entrance to the sanctuary. Um, you know, it was a large wash bin made of brass. The, the priests here washed their hands and feet before offering sacrifice or entering the sanctuary. And the water represent what? The cleansing from sin and the new bed. And that's the, what Paul also said that you know, in Corinthians that we're baptized to Moses when he referred to the Red Sea experience, the whole experience of baptism as a um, part of the plan of salvation. Um, when you get into the holy place, um, you are looking at the table of shoe bread, which represents Jesus, the living bread. And the seven branch candlesticks also represent Jesus, the light of the world, and the oil, which is a representation of the Holy Spirit. Then you have the altar of incense that represents the prayers of God's people. And basically, if you think about what's uh, between the, the altar called the holy place and the most holy place in our Christian journey, basically, God, the holy place, this is where God dwells. So if you, you are at the altar um, you know, of sacrifice, that's the first point of contact. That's where the sacrifice took place, takes place. So if you accept that sacrifice and you get into the holy place, these three things, as I'm talking about the, the showbread, um, the light, the candlesticks, and the, the altar of incense, these are three things that really um, helps our growth in terms of our Christian experience and whole process of sanctification, which has to do with, um, you know, the bread, um, which is the word of God. We need that. We need that to grow. Um, we talk about prayers. There's a way we communicate um, with God. And so, you know, as a Christian, we, we do have um, that experience of, you know, talking to God and also listening to him through his word. And then witnessing, you know, um, you know, the light, the oil, the light that, um, you know, that shows from the, the candlesticks, you should let our light shine. And so uh, these are three very key components. So if you think about all that was revealed in Sinai uh, with the sanctuary plan, really it was God revealing himself, revealing his ultimate plan of salvation. And, um, you know, the question is, you know, if... Um, this plan was revealed to them at that time. What does it really also mean for us? I don't think anything changes for us today as well. It's those same things, except the fact that Christ, the ultimate sacrifice, or everything that was done at that point was pointing to Christ. Now Christ has come. And so um, all those sanctuary services are no longer, but uh, it's the same plan that you know we as um, children, of faith, you know, through um, our acceptance of the sacrifice that Christ gave, uh, also have access to this same plan of salvation. The author writes, um, and I want to read this in a quick way. It says, um, though the Lord had redeemed Israel from the bondage of Egypt, he wanted them to understand the redemption um, had a greater, more significant meaning than merely freedom from physical bondage. He wanted to redeem them from sin, the ultimate slavery. And this could happen only through the sacrifice of the Messiah as taught in the types and the symbols of the sanctuary service. It's no wonder then that not long after they were redeemed from bondage, the given law, the Israelites were instructed to build the sanctuary and establish its services for in these things, God uh, revealed to them the plan of salvation, which is the true meaning and purpose of the covenant. So for the covenant, it's nothing if, uh, if not a covenant of salvation that the Lord offers to fallen humanity. So that is what was in Eden, and that is what was at Sinai. So he, the, the author really takes us even back to Eden, where the God's original purpose um, for man, which was, um, you know, for man to rule the earth with him, um, got uh, disrupted with the entrance of sin. So in addition, really, um, the sanctuary wasn't just also to reveal God's plan of salvation, but it was also a symbol of God seeking to be with his children. Because if you read Exodus 25, verse 8, 
He says, uh, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So God really has, the lesson has always been pointing out, is a relationship seeking God. He's the one who initiates this covenant. He's the one who is coming after us. He's the one who is seeking to restore us unto himself. And that is really the whole idea about this covenant. And it's very refreshing if you think about it, like, you know, a sinner like me and God is really interested in me. He wants to bring me onto himself. And um, the, the way he does that is this through this plan of salvation. And I think uh, our job is to cooperate with him, accept it and work with him. And so that sort of leads us into the Wednesday's lesson, which talks about God and Israel. But when he says God and Israel, um, I think we have to look at it in two ways. I mean, Israel, literal Israel in ancient times and also spiritual Israel, because, uh, you know, as uh, it said, uh, um, Paul, Paul wrote in Galatians, he says for you know, Christians, we are all spiritual Israel Christians of today, because if you are Christ, um, you know, you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. And, you are also heirs according to the promise. So um, when we, we look at what the experience was um, you know, between God and the Israelites, as I said before in the preceding lesson, God delivered them. The deliverance had taken place. So when they got to Sinai and God said, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So reading the text, it's, uh, if you read it in isolation or without context um, of all that we have been said and all that has taken place before this, then, you know, it's... Uh, you run into the danger of misinterpreting or misreading it to into maybe drawing the conclusion that obedience is uh, a requirement to carry favor with God. Or obedience is a condition of salvation, which uh, really is not, uh, you know, biblical. So if, if you, you, you look at what um, Paul also says, basically in Romans, and I'm going to take a few more minutes to read um, some of these. Um, I think it's, it just makes it clear that there's no other way that you can read this text, um, you know, into thinking or into the conclusion that you know, basically we are saved by obeying the law. And if you go back, you know, I think there are some, sometimes um, people think of the new and the old covenant, the old covenant, People think it's about works. The new covenant is, is about uh, faith, um, grace and faith. But um, it's really salvation has always been by grace through faith. This hasn't, that hasn't changed from the Old Testament, and it hasn't changed in the New Testament. Even as a matter of fact, when you go to Hebrews 11 and Paul start listing the, the hall where we call the hall of fame of the, the faithful, you know, Abraham, Moses, and all those people, they were all saved by faith. There was no works involved. Salvation as was always by faith. They, by faith, faith looking out to the promise of the coming Savior, they were saved. So they looked up to the sacrifice. They looked forward to the sacrifice that was coming by way of Christ. And we of today will look back to that same sacrifice um, as a way of uh, getting salvation. So it's just uh, by grace, we are saved through faith in that sacrifice that was um, done by Christ. So I'm going to read um, Romans 3, 19 to 24, just a little bit of what Paul says to clarify this so um, we are clear on what this means in, in terms of our understanding. So Romans chapter 3, verse 19 to 24. Uh, 
So he says, now we know whatever, we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So basically, Paul is saying the law, really the use of the law is for us to know sin. As we've said in previous conversations, the law is really a mirror. It's not what saves us. Uh, Romans 6, 1 to 2. What shall we say? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many as of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into death? So as we come to accept Christ and we are baptized, we're dying to sin. And uh, really, you know, once we die to sin, then the cooperation with God comes into place where we work with him to... Um, really live the life that he wants for us, the life that will also be a testimony for others to come and know him, who is the true God. Uh, Romans 7, 7, one last, and then we'll move on. Um, it says, uh, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law has said it, you shall not prevent. So Paul is basically reinforcing the whole idea of the law is just there to point us, you know, um, our, to, to reveal to us our need for the Savior. And so um, as the, the Lord said in, the, in, in Exodus uh, through the pro prophet Moses, he wants to make um, he wants to make Israel a peculiar nation, a nation of kingdom and priests. And uh, we, spiritual Israel, I think is that same relationship the Lord is seeking for us as well. He wants to make us a peculiar treasure. And as um, Peter said, we are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his special people who must proclaim the praises of him who have called us out of darkness into his marvelous life. So it is really my prayer that um, we will, you know, cooperate and work with the Lord that, you know, we can be uh, that peculiar people who will be able to be a light for the world because uh, this world is, uh, you know, full of darkness and we know the rulers of the world are, you know, um, rulers of darkness. And so we really, we need the Lord to be able to help us. And we can only always open, uh, he's always open his arms and he's willing to work with us to be able to fulfill his purpose for us um, in our lives. So I want to end here and um, I pray that the Lord will give us strength to be able to walk with him. Amen. Thank you, Isaac. Wonderful. You know, I'm, Recalling a conversation I had with a professor once upon a time stating why Israel was the promised land. And you just triggered that memory because you said he called us out to be a holy nation and to be a peculiar treasure. Mm -hmm. Israel, where it was located, was along a trade route. And so uh, foreigners with foreign gods would come through it. And the goal, I think partially of the promised land was to show these people uh, that would pass through Israel that the God of heaven has this group of people and they are peculiar and here's the true God and yeah. spread that message along the trade routes of ancient uh, Near East back then. But very interesting. And so then I questioned myself and I suppose uh, it's a good question for the week also is how is my life peculiar so that other people know that I worship the true God. What does that really look like? And we don't have time tonight to unpack that. But I think that's part of the covenant promise, uh, which I'm sure uh, Pastor Gilbert will talk about promises here in a moment. But I think that's part of the purpose of the covenant is to allow us to be uh, a peculiar people. So um, Pastor Gilbert, uh, Thursday looks interesting with promises, promises. 
And so I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you, Jamie, so much. What, a, what an incredible lesson, huh? Uh, the, the title is kind of a catchy, right? Promises, 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 <laughs> right? Promises. We all, we all have gone there, right? You know, we make promises and uh, sometimes, you know, we, we have to kind of uh, uh, make amends too, right? So Thursday lesson is pretty much a lesson that is asking the question, you know, works and faith. Can I save myself? I heard somebody say one time, you know, I admire people that pick themselves up by the boot, boot and do right. But uh, and this, this guy said, I can't. I cannot even walk without the grace of God. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. Man, that says it all, right? How can we in any way, shape, or form say that we're better than other people? In the book of Steps to Christ, Ellen White talks about the sins that we, so-called Christians, sometimes the Pharisees, you know, the guardians of the, the church, uh, we, we talk so much about it. And she says, you know, we, we talk about uh, the drunk, the drunkard. We talk about the prostitute. But she goes on to say that there are sins that sometimes you cannot quantify and qualify. She talks about pride. She talks about arrogance and many other things that, uh, according to Ellen White, she says, those sins will keep people away from heaven. And we love to talk about other people's sins. We love to talk about other people's faults. But uh, according to this Bible text, we all have sinned and we all fall short from the glory of God. And I think this is something that uh, we Christians should be really be thinking about it. That we're not better than anybody else. My sin is not yours, but yours is not mine. But the, the reality is they're all sin, right? So promises, 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 and promises. The first Bible verse here on Thursday's lesson is found in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. And it says, all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. Promises, promises, promises. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Oh, boy. Whatever happened when you turned a page, you know, from the book of Exodus, from one chapter to another, you're not seeing anything moving upwards. You're seeing just things moving downwards. Isn't that right? By the time Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments from God, from the hands of God, written by the finger of God, people are already making and worshiping an idol down the hill. Promises, promises, promises. Romans chapter 9, verse 31 and 32. It says here, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, they did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. How amazing. And we, as God's people, we that are part of the remnant church of God. We are so proud of that, aren't we? And sometimes we need to be very careful that our being of the remnant church of God, our being the church with the right doctrines and, and the, the right teachings of scriptures, that can become a, an idol in itself. And we have to be very careful with that. Hebrews chapter 4 is the next verse. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 3. It says, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. How many times we become worshipers of self and not worshipers 
of God. We live in a very interesting society. When we talk about Psalms, you know, especially Psalms 23, and I would like to make a parenthesis here real quick. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The other day I was just meditating about the word Lord and where that was taking me. I thought about slavery. I thought about having a master. The Lord is my master. I am the Lord's slave, right? The Apostle Paul used the word doulos and he says, I'm, you know, I'm a servant. I'm a slave of the Lord. In Psalm 23 that says, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Sometimes I feel that we live in a society that goes something like this. I lack nothing. I want absolutely nothing. Therefore, I don't need a Lord. It's almost kind of backwards nowadays, right? Who needs a master when you lack absolutely nothing? Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. Oh, my. Some amazing Bible verses, right? That help us to kind of understand a little bit about this promise, this covenant. Sometimes a covenant of self, not a covenant with God. I'm going real quick here. Uh, in the middle of the lesson on Thursday, it says, If, however, the Bible again and again stresses works, why can't works make us acceptable in God's sight? And here comes the first Bible verse here in the middle of, of the lesson. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. And it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, to his, his or hers own way. And the Lord has laid on him, or, you know, on Jesus in this case, the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 64 now, verse 6, it says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind. It takes us away. Another Bible verse that I already read today, Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Unfortunately, it says here in the lesson, the Hebrew people believed that their obedience became the means of their salvation, not the result of salvation. I think this is a wake-up call for us. We are saved by His righteousness, not by mine. And sometimes I believe that as Christians, we need to be so careful that we're not looking at each other to point out their faults, their sins, their shortcomings. Because the Bible says that we all fall short from the glory of God. We are all sinners. And I think, uh, especially when you start promising and promising like the Bible text says, we will do whatever the Lord asks us. Wow. How long did that last, right? Can you imagine? In one breath, God's people are saying, we'll do whatever he asks. In the next sentence, here's Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and they are already worshiping an idol. Promises, promises, promises. We are all sinners. We all fall short from the glory of God, and we are saved by his faithfulness, not his righteousness, not ours. I think that's it for the lesson on Thursday, Jamie. I'm not sure if you want to touch some other topics of the lesson here. I think um, I think it just circles back to the need to be born on his eagle's wings because uh, we all fall short. And um, he can encompass us. He can, he can instruct us. He can guide us. Pastor, why don't you close us with prayer this evening?
would love to. Let's bow our heads and close our prayer then. Heavenly Father, we thank you for reminding us that uh, we are all sinners, that we all fall short from the glory of God. Father, we want to thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the one who said, anyone who calls upon my name will be saved. Father, thank you for reminding us that Jesus is enough. Father, as we look at covenants, as we look at the law, as we look at the teachings of our church, Father, we pray that all of those will be means to our continuous growth in you, that we may understand better the law, that we may understand better the sacrifice of Christ. But most importantly, Father, that we will not forget that Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our sacrifice. That Jesus is our tabernacle. That Jesus is the bread of life. That Jesus is, Lord, what connects us together with one another. So, Father, we pray for the body of Christ, our church, the Corona Church. And I pray, Father, that you continue to help every single one of us that are part of this body to help one another, to love one another, to accept one another, to serve one another. And of course, Father, to learn and grow together, even at times correct one another. Father, we all need counseling. We all need growth. We all need a double portion of the Holy Spirit. We all need to do better as Christians. So, Father, we pray that you will continue to unite us, strengthen us, but I pray that we'll never forget who is the head of the church. So thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our covenant, our salvation, the living water, the bread of life, the one who intercedes on our behalf according to the book of Hebrews. So we thank you, Father, as we continue to study about the covenant and the promises that you have given us. We pray that you please help us, Lord, to be faithful, to love one another, and to continue to lead your church as, as pastors, as elders, as teachers, to the teachings of Jesus, to the foot of the cross, the place where we all find a place for redemption, salvation, forgiveness, and most importantly, eternal life. We thank you. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Happy Sabbath. Thank you.